So I'm very excited today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Shannon Bell. Dr. Bell is a performance philosopher who lives and writes philosophy in action and experimental philosophy. She's also the founder of Fast Feminism, or more to the point, she is fast feminist. Influenced by the works of Michel Foucault, Judith Butler, and Paul Virilio, this critical action theory is perversely provocative and forces philosophy to confront what one reviewer has called its stodgy frigidity. She encourages us to always commit violence to past assumptions or ideas to push beyond our comfortable point of inertia, to act quickly, with speed, and to involve the body as a lived instrument of philosophical experimentation. At the risk of sounding trite, Dr. Bell really does practice what she preaches. She is also a professor and graduate program director in the York University Political Science Department, where she teaches postmodern theory, fast feminism, sexual politics, cyber politics, identity politics, and violence philosophy. She is the author of seven books. Is that right? I've lost count. That would be great. Including the groundbreaking reading, writing, and rewriting the prostitute body, horror carnival, and fast feminism. I'm very much looking forward to what you have to say today, so that is you. Thank you. So I'm going to show films throughout. They'll be looping in the background. By the way, it's really nice to see everyone here. Um, and I was really impressed when I looked at the flyer, A, to be part of the series, but also just the number of different departments that are co-sponsoring this is really quite incredible to bring that whole group of, of departments together. So that's just fantastic. <coughs> and now, I was going to show you, the first one is going to be on fast feminism, but I think what I want to show is a different a different fast feminism one. Well, maybe not. This is a bit tamer, but I'll use it. Um, the first part of the talk, I should put that on loop. The first part of the talk will will talk about the work on fast feminism. And the second part is going to, or the second two thirds probably, and I'll do some more on it tomorrow is going to be on shooting theory. So we're going to look, the body's going to disappear. So I'll probably talk for an hour, an hour and 10 minutes. And what I don't finish, I'll pick up tomorrow. For people that have not registered for the workshop tomorrow, but want to come to the workshop and want the readings for it, my card is right here. Uh, pick it up and just email me tonight, and I'll send you the, I'll send you the readings. So the t and let me know if you can't hear well enough, and I'll, I'll use that particular mic. The talk will revisit, or this talk, will revisit, and that was me getting my um, internal phallus impression there. It will revisit fast feminism as a site of Virilian techno speed, setting out a fast feminist inter enactment of what Paul Virilio deems the accident of art. For Virilio, the accident of art is a shift from representation to presentation, a shift that in his book, The Accident of Art, he terms visual, phenomenological, and effective. Instead of the modern representation, that's with the uh, Delagrace Volcano, instead of the modern representation which occupied space, what characterizes the latter half of the 20th century and the 21st century so far is the postmodern presentation or performance which occupies time, moves through time, thereby compressing the time of the past and the future into today's instantaneity. And you guys are probably thinking, nice penis. Art, I want to run through Virilio because the Virilio Dictionary came out. I did two entries on that. One, I was very thrilled to do an entry on fast feminism in the Virilio Dictionary. The other one that I was asked to do was on the accident of art, which really kind of goes into the work I do and into a number of the, the, uh, the work a number of the people in the series do. Art is the casualty of war, is Virilio's theory of art in a nutshell. And contemporary art for Virilio is both terrorist and terrorized. According to Virilio, there's three stages of terrorist and terrorized art. So after World War I, 
was the first stage. After the Second World War is the second stage and the art of the present or the instant. After World War I, he's thinking of people like Otto Dix, German Expressionism, and George Brock, uh, Cubist Surrealism. What they did was they, if you've seen their work, and their work's amazing, um, they collected these smithereened bodies, the smithereened reality that was destroyed. It was like the destruction of reality by the war. So in their, in their painting, they collected smithereened reality into disfigured representations wherein the face disappeared. Virilio claims that one cannot understand data or surrealism without World War I. Just as one cannot understand Joseph Boyce without awareness that he was a German pilot, a bombardier in the Second World War. Virilio contends that contemporary art has been a war victim through surrealism, it's all the stuff we like basically, right? Through surrealism, expressionism, Viennese actionism, and terrorism today. And it is this shift in the early 60s from disfigured representation to actionism, performance art, body art, and event art, that in conjunction with new technological capabilities by the last decade of the 20th century, gave rise to what Virilio calls his new terrorism in art in the book, The Art of the Motor. So the new terrorism brings into the gallery, and we have artists here that, that, that um, in attendance today, two or three that I've seen, that engage in what Virilio would consider the new terrorism of art. It's a new form of art brute, a biological and technologically enhanced art, both amateur and professional. So you'll note that my stuff is amateur, um, just in case. So I would be considered one of the amateur um, contributors to art brute. With no distinction between live event and a presentation. So professional examples, what, what Virilio refers to in his own work are people like Orlan, Stellark, the two, he calls them the two best body artists. He also refers to Gunther von Hagens, Dr. Gunther von Hagens, the plastination body corpse artist creator of Body Worlds, which really show, is showing worldwide now. And he refer, is referring to what Ars Electronica now calls hybrid art. Now, can everybody hear okay at the back? Because I'm not, it's good, yeah. I, th I thought the acoustics in here are pretty good. Hybrid art includes artists like Orrin Katz, Yonette Zur from Tissue Culture and Art Project, who culture human and other animal cells into semi-living art objects capable of living in a bioreactor. And you probably saw my phalluses and big toe in a bioreactor there. He's also referring to uh, hybrid art as Ars Electronica understands it is um, something like Stellark's recent partial head, a digital transplant of his face onto a hominoid skull seated with ovine smooth muscle cells and grown in a bioreactor, his surgically implanted multifunctional ear on, on arm prosthesis, which is never quite working okay, um, which is always going to be on the arm or has to be taken off because the body rejects it. Um, Eduardo Katz, I don't know if you've seen Eduardo Katz, transgenic petunia flower, which was one of the winners of the golden Nike at that um, Ars Electronica two or three years ago, and it's called the Edwuna, so Petunia Edwuna. Um, it's an engineered petunia that expresses the artist's DNA sequenced from his blood, which is very interesting. And probably one of the most, um, to me, one of the most interesting pieces is Marianne uh, Lavelle uh, Genet Jete's um, piece where she inter injects horse blood plasma into her body. And of course, what, it was done in uh, Chapel Gallery in Ljubljana, which is one of the places that, that is, is a really wonderful place. I've been there a few times. I've never showed there, but I've been at lots of, of shows there. Um, and it's a high-risk gallery. It will do shows that other galleries are afraid to do, right? So, you know, that's one of the places that Yolnet and Warren started off with um, uh, living cells. It's also where uh, Marta de Menzies did modified butterfly wings. It's just, if you're ever, if you're in Ljubljana, which you should be in Ljubljana because they have a great art and music scene and digital scene, um, this gallery consistently does stuff that it's, it's, it's just a real leader 
So she did this horse plasma, the injection of horse blood plasma into her body, and then it's a live documented performance called May the Horse Live in Me. So these artist practices are precisely what Virilio terms extreme art. What he identifies in art and fear as manifestations of the accident of art. Practices that aim, according to Virilio, at nothing less than to embark biology on the road to a kind of expressionism. Fast feminist art brood includes phallic bioart performance and installation along with avatar and robot seduction. Um, I'm just going to read the, the phallic bioart performance today. I may read something out of the avatar um, seduction tomorrow. Bioart, an art practice in which humans work with living tissue, bacteria, living orgasm, organisms, <laughs> or orgasms too, <laughs> um, and life processes, is hyperperformic performative, and depending on the artist, may engage in what Arthur Croker in Body Drift describes as Donna Haraway's crucial contribution to the postmodern future. And it's her concept of companion species. Here it's broadened to include biomaterial companions. Certainly specific works of Katzenzur, Stellark, Eduardo Katz, Lavelle, um, Lavelle Genet, Jete, fall into the grouping of companion species bioart, as does that of some of the work of performance artist Kira O'Reilly. Particularly, and she's in Regina right now, she's a British performance artist, and we've presented together. Um, if you're not familiar with Kira's work, I would take a look at it. She did an um, infamous durational piece, a piece through time with a dead pig honoring the pig's contribution of biomaterials which she'd used in her art science lab work. Then she did a piece, also a durational performance, called Falling Asleep with a Pig, in which the artist lived with a pig, called Delayla, for some days in a specifically uh, constructed sty in the gallery. Um, and it was commissioned for a show called Interspecies. So I wouldn't say that the bioart I've done falls into the genre of companion species. Rather, it's more of a performative, critical feminist engagement of continental philosophy. And really, that's kind of what I'm always about. Interestingly, Croker, in Body Drifts, positions the feminist trinity of Judith Butler, Catherine Hales, and Donna Haraway as, quote, the late 20th and early 21st century counterparts of a tradition of thought formulated in all its passionate intensity and unavoidable enigmas by Marx, Heidegger, and Nietzsche, not in a reductive or reiterated, a re reiterative sense, but in the larger meaning of critical intellectual imagination. Namely, and Arthur's I studied with Arthur. In fact, Arthur's one of the people that I owe being a theorist to, but his sentences are always really long, so I'm still on the same sentence. Namely, just, just so you know, namely that in this renewed tradition of critical feminism, the fate of the body first theorized in the differing vocabularies of historical materialism, nihilism, and bad consciousness that is theorized by Nietzsche, Marx, and Heidegger are taken up again once more by the three he's talking about. So fast feminism is a companion feminist species of critical feminism. The work, my work, strategically depicts both body drift and what I would term, so this is my new concept that I'm sort of trying out right now, um, conceptual drift. So body drift, of course, reiterates the fact that we no longer inhabit a body in an, any meaningful sense. And then Gad said to me, but did we ever? And the question really is, my, my friend Gad's right there, um, the question is, did we ever? And, and probably not. We just thought we did, obviously, right? So, so body drift reiterates the fact that we no longer inhabit a body in any meaningful sense of the term, but rather occupy a multiplicity of bodies. Imaginary, sexualized, disciplined, gendered, laboring, technologically augmented bodies. These are the ones that Croker identifies. I would say that body drift 
is also a companion concept of Mika Cardenas's trans real. And her concept of the trans real has components which span virtual and biotechnological realities. Cardenas in Becoming Dragon specifies, quote, that any identity in the process of becoming can be thought of as trans real, as it exists in the present but also a potential in multiple states of reality. It has a potential or exists, it exists as a potential, potential in multiple states of reality. Becoming Dragon is part of the book I'm sure you guys have read, because I've read it. Once I, once I heard I was going to be part of the series, I immediately ordered Feminist and Queer Information Studies Reader, which is edited by Patrick Kilty and Rebecca Dean. It's a great book. Um, and Cardenas' piece is, is in this book, as well as on ctheory.net, the Croker's um, theory website. So Cardenas, and she's also speaking here. She's speaking here on March 27th. And I would def I'm definitely going to be at that. <coughs> Excuse me, as I, I hope to see many of you here, because she's doing really fascinating, interesting work with the, um, and she's got a, a self who's a dragon. And I won't say anything more about that, but look at her article. So she dis but she discloses, what I like about her work is she discloses a politics inherent in the concept of the trans real. Trans real, this is her, trans real, or this is them, I should probably say them, I'm not sure it's a her. Trans real identity destabilizes epistemological systems which would privilege real phenomena such as the body or real world social integrations and extends the necessary field of investigation into vir virtual, digital, and fantasy worlds. Now conceptual drift, which is my concept, and I seem to have what everybody in Toronto has, which is coughing all the time, so bear with me. I think it's, I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's just annoying. Um, conceptual drift takes a thinker's signature concept. So you know, this is Deleuze's idea that every thinker has a signature concept. You're probably thinking, what's my signature concept? Well, probably, and you can tell what somebody's signature concept is when they, especially with me, when they meet you and they go, oh yeah, I've seen your stuff and they won't tell you what it is. It's like the stuff I did on female ejaculation, for sure. So that could be one of his signature concepts. I, I mean, I hope fast feminism is a signature concept. I hope shooting theory could be a signature concept. But conceptual drift takes a thinker's con signature concept. Now you'll see how this connects with Deleuze. Maintains the original meaning and simultaneously infuses additional, perhaps questionable meanings that take the original concept somewhere else. So the person, like in my personal, one of the people I really like doing conceptual drift on, like in fact I just love doing conceptual drift on this thinker, is Heidegger. First of all, I really like reading Heidegger. Secondly, I really like fucking with him because he so deserves it, but in a sense, <laughs> but, but in a sense in which you hold the integrity of the original thought to some way, and then you go elsewhere with it. So I'm always doing that with, with Heidegger, and at York it's really, it's, I'm very lucky, it's really easy to find graduate students who want to do reading courses on Heidegger, right? So I've been reading just a lot of Heidegger, and, and you know, as the people that teach in this room know, graduate students are really great on reading courses because they will teach you the text. So I've been taught Being in Time, I've been taught The Event, I've been taught like about 12 books of Heidegger's, right? So I'm really, you know, and it's great. So, and, and, you, and I keep always thinking, you know, ah, I wonder what I can do with that, right? You can always do something with it. So conceptual drift is a different way, basically, of presenting um, Deleuze's approach of taking a philosopher from behind, relocating his, her philosophical concepts in a way that does violence to the original thought, but not so much violence that it eradicates it. Philosophy, as those of you who have read What is Philosophy, which I just finished reading actually, um, says Deleuze, so philosophy for Deleuze is the activity of creating concepts, which is great because you can create image concepts, sound concepts, um, written concepts, and 
what Deleuze says is the concept is always signed by its philosopher creator. In fast feminism and shooting theory, I work with signed concepts and engage in conceptual drift. So for example, fast feminism wouldn't exist as a discursive field, that's a field of thought and practice, without Paul Virilio's concepts of speed and the accident. Other sites of conceptual drift in fast feminism are Lacan's phallus. I must say I've had lots of fun with Lacan's phallus. <laughs> Bataille's, con really, it's like, it's like the best concept. Because um, nobody, nobody can have the phallus, right? So you can like, so then you can do all sorts of things like grow them. Um, Bataille's risk, Levinas's face. So these are all signature concepts that I really wanted to work with in fast <coughs> feminism and then continued on to work with and various other ones in shooting theory, which I'll get to. So the operative principles in fast feminism are that as FF, that's fast feminist, and I have it branded on my arm. I should have worn like a short t-shirt, but I didn't. But I have FF branded on my arm. Um, that's what the book ends with. And the operative principle is never write about anything I haven't done and that I locate my enactments inside of philosophical discourse. So you can probably guess I'm probably sticking it to philosophy, well-doing philosophy. Um, the underlying contention is that feminism needs to be infused from non-obvious philosophical locations. And what I would say about critical uh, feminism that Croker's talking about is that he's, although they're more obvious than fast feminism, these are also sort of non-obvious locations. The work of Haraway, who's really been taken up as a, as a socialist feminist, the work of um, Butler, again, who's recognized as a feminist, but a queer feminist, and all, which is really important because that takes it, it takes it in a different direction. Um, and also um, the woman who did how we became post-human, Kathleen Hales, who hasn't been taken up as a feminist as much. And her books are very interesting because she's doing to science, in a sense, what I would, on a great day, would aspire to do with philosophy. And she's been successfully doing it for quite a long time. So this idea that you need to infuse what you're working on from other locations, the most non-obvious site for me is the work of Paul Virilio. Partly because he's a hyper-masculinist philosopher, partly because he's a technologist of speed. The other thing that attracted me to Virilio is he believes in God. I thought that's kind of interesting when it goes together with all the other stuff. He was a painter, he studied with Matisse, he's an architect, he's very interesting. He writes like Ernest Hemingway, he does theory like Ernest Hemingway, like really sort of short, fast sentences. I just thought he's like really fascinating. So fast feminism is situated simultaneously as a complement to his speed theory. He came out with a book <coughs> years ago now that I teach, have taught for a long time on modern political thought called speed, um, speed politics, speed and politics. So what I'm doing is a complement to speed theory and it's an accident of speed theory. So I sent my book to Virilio, but I didn't hear back from him. But the book didn't come back, so I don't know. Um, I wanted him as part of my full, uh, uh, to be one of the assessors for my um, promotion to full. Um, but some Virilio scholars were, but he wasn't. But I just thought it'd be really interesting to see, for somebody to see what, what you had done with their theory that had no, that had no sort of idea of where, because you don't know as a writer, as a theorist, you don't know where your theory is going to go, right? So. At, an accident of any system, whether that system be ecological, technological, or philosophical, is the unknown inherent in the original substance. So fast feminism is inherent in Virilio's speed in three locations. The fiercely courageous speed style that profoundly critiques the world quickly and breaks intellectual scholarship. The recurrent messianic moment that Virilio never fully hides if you save one person, you save the world. The world and human are identical. And thirdly, in Virilio's positioning of the body as the basis of his work. 
I am a materialist of the body, which means that the body is the basis of my work. When I talk about speed, I talk about bodies. That's a quote from Virilio, and it's a surprising quote. Of course, the body has always been central in feminist philosophy and practice, but the coupling with speed, I claim, is fast feminism. Well, fast feminism is the accident of feminism and hypermasculinity. Like any invented substance, it can give rise to its own accident, its own unknown, on which it both thrives and disintegrates. So fast feminism is a feminism of effect, that is, of intensity and influence. And as a feminism of effect, there's no way of predicting what women or entities influenced by fast feminism will do as a result of that influence. For instance, and I never predicted this when I, when I did this book, or the work for this book, fast feminism has taken me to what I term shooting theory. That is theory in action. In a sense, the illegitimate offspring of fast feminism, shooting theory, is really the evacuation of the body to images, of the philosophical and theoretical. So it's the evacuation of the body to images of the philosophical and the theoretical. The body drift, then, is to images. But before we get there, a bit about free-floating organs that's biological entities kept alive technologically. So this is the last chapter in Fast Feminism, and it's, it's an excerpt out of there. Now read that to you, and then we'll go on to shooting theory. So you can see, like these are, th those are uh, polymers that are, that are seeded with um, biological cells. So, Two phalluses and a big toe. FF wanted to learn everything she could about tissue-engineered organs without bodies. As a performance philosopher, she was invited to do a tissue engineering art residency at Symbiotica in the Department of Anatomy and Human Biology at the University of Western Australia, Perth. Symbiotica was the first research laboratory to allow artists to engage in wet biological practices in a PC2 certified tissue culture laboratory. So it's a big deal. It was a big deal. Everybody kind of went there. Subsequent laboratories have been developed. And Katz and Zier have aided people in developing subsequent um, laboratories that are PC2 uh, certified. Bioartists Oren Katz and Yolnet Zier taught me the process of tissue engineering. So that is thawing cells, growing cells, feeding cells, seeding cells on biodegradable polymers, and killing contaminated cells. On a daily basis, I practically, pragmatically, engage the grounding question of philosophy. What is being? That's Heidegger's question. For Lacan, being is in language and has its root, or has at its root, the phallus. Quote, what the phallus denotes is the power of signification. The phallus denotes the power of the signified signifier to bring the signified into being. So my project, Two Phalluses and a Big Toe, was part of Tissue Cult and Arts Project called the Wizard of Oz program. So it was an update of the heart, brain, and courage motif in the, in the Wizard of Oz, but as the update, three performance artists, philosophers, who desired to grow a new organ, did so in Perth. Stellark worked on his ear, Orlan grew skin, and as for me, I fabricated a phallus or two. Two phalluses and a big toe implements Martin Heidegger's approach to art as a means of revealing new entities to unconcealed truth. It functions as a comment on Jacques Lacan's claim that no one can be the phallus, by showing that the phallus can be alive and with no one. It biotechnically realizes Georges Bataille's big toe as a site of waste and dirtiness and the organ which marks us as human. So I grew these three organs, a male phallus, a female phallus, and a big toe in a bioreactor. You can see there, there's the relics of it. Um, in a bioreactor, where they formed into a neal organ. The big toe anchored the two phallus, phalluses as they 
as, they, as their Tecna body rotated. The organs, when they're in the bioreactor, the organs themselves, are partial life objects that can only survive in a nutrient solution. And so it's a nutrient solution filled bioreactor that really mimics the human body conditions. As I learned the process of tissue engineering in art, I was deploying this new medium to complement my work on the female phallus that began in 89. I was always really interested about female phallus, right? And, you know, I, I measured mine, etc. So since most of my work on the body has been to disclose the erect female phallus, I figured that tissue culture would be a new medium to produce this as a new species or organ or a neal sex organ. So the female phallus originated from an alginate mold, which you saw us taking here, of my 7-inch. It's very important that it's 7-inch. It's completely normal. 7-inch um, or 17.7 centimeter internal erect phallus. The male phallus was modeled on a generic 7-inch dildo that we found at a sex store. Um, and the big toe was cast from, from my toe, on the, my, my right big toe. The phalluses and big toe grew in the condition of microgravity, which is like free fall if you've done any, um, if you've done any parachuting, um, to, which is really great actually. So they, they actually grow in this condition because they're always in free fall. Tissue engineered objects exist in a permanent condition of free fall. They hold stasis as their techno body rotates. So stasis or permanent free fall is the most desirable state for cell adherence and evenly distributed cell growth because the medium washes over the polymer structure. The three identities, I was really proud of this, the three identities floated in the vibrant pink solution, the idealized male phallic form, the fetishized big toe, and the emergent female phallus. In the bioreactor, these forms modified and they morphed into a new singularity contingent on the techno will of the reactor and on rotation. It's a totally unique irreproducible organ. That is, if you put the same organs into a bioreactor another time, the result would be a different form. It's undeterminable prior to its origin, which makes it so cool. Death of the phalluses and big toe. FF stopped, and there's the bioreactor. Um, FF stopped by symbiotica to check in, I was running in to check in it on, on all the time on the weekend, on the neal sex organ forming in the bioreactor. I opened the door of the incubator to find the emergent partial life turning in a urine colored nutrient, which I thought was pretty interesting. However, you have to kill it. The beautiful pink medium from which they get their nutrients had turned a golden yellow color. It had become contaminated and the core of the bioreactor was actually contaminated. Once, um, which wasn't really my fault, but <laughs> just saying, just saying that I didn't really contaminate them myself, <laughs> but the bioreactor itself is contaminated. Once a semi-living or partial life is contaminated in a bioreactor, it must be removed and killed. And so this is phallus trajectory. Put daddy's phallus in a bioreactor. Daddy's phallus morphed with my phallus and big toe. A biotechno Lolita post-human fable was growing. For those of you that know Lolita, this is a quote. With the human element dwindling, the passion, the tenderness only increased. Neil's sex organ, death of the phallus, death in the bioreactor, micro death of a Neil species in post Venice. Actually, I'm wrong. That quote is not, that quote's actually from Death in Venice. It's not from Lolita, sorry. There are no mistakes in theory and action. Performance philosophy is defined by enactment, active enfolding with or performative being with. A performance philosopher will not theoretically engage which she is not enacted or enacted with. And again, I'm going to say there are a number of performance philosophers in the room who I've seen them perform. Um, in fast feminism, or if fast feminism were to have a manifesto, it would be these seven ten tendencies Critique the world quickly, interrupt intellectual scholarship, position the body as the basis of intellectual work, write theory as art, do art as theory, do theory from non-obvious points of departure, do violence to the original context. 
These seven tendencies developed in interaction with Virilio's work. They're also highly operative in shooting theory, except for number three, position the body as the basis of intellectual work. So I'm going to change, I'm going to change the video now. Um, and I've got about seven of them here. I want to start off, I'm going to start off with this one. Um, that's rock. You're going to see lots of rocks, because I'm <laughs> different rock formations. <laughs> um, so since 2007, I've been working on shooting theory, bringing together digital video technology and print textual philosophy or, or theory through imaging philosophical theoretical concepts. The idea, and I use this all the time when I teach, so anybody who takes a course with me, um, at, and I teach third, um, fourth, and graduate level courses. So anyone who takes a course with me, depending if it's a full year course, they do two films that accompany each of their papers. So they do conceptual films, and I have a conceptual film on for every time when I lecture in a lecture course, one that I've made. And I'll probably show you a SEMO and Lacan at the end here. So, and, and partly I was just really committed to try and bring theory together with a digital component. And of course also my lectures are on um, webcast and, and um, all of that. But the idea for me is, is to transpose Martin Heidegger's claim regarding technology. That you can't think techno technology technologically. And I want to transpose this to the practice of political thought. The overarching argument is that you can't think political theory simply within language. Heidegger contended that the place from which to think technology is art. I contend that the sites in which to think, produce, and enliven written theoretical tech concepts are visual images and soundscapes that can be brought forth by digital video technology. Shooting theory combines the techne of digital videography with the skills of philosophical thinking, allowing this artistic endeavor to bring forth a digital materiality of the concept. So I've done 12 films so far, actually probably 13. I've done 12 film projects as conceptual theory. I've worked with some people, I've worked on my own. What I'm referring to is, as the conceptual theory are 12 image texts, that's print and film, in which I take a sign concept in continental philosophy and shoot it. And there's a play on shoot, obviously. So the first one I did, which I'm not showing, um, this is the second, I think one of the second ones I did. The first one I did was dynamic stillness, um, 40 days and 40 nights of sunrise and sunset in the Judean desert. So I shot sunrise and sunset for 40 days and 40 nights. Um, it was for a conference on digital and something in Australia, and it was, it was a conference on stillness. All right? So I was using Heidegger's concept of stillness. Now, shooting sunrise and sunset is actually really amazing. The one thing you learn is, hey, you have to be on time, and I was for 40 days and 40 nights, which was not easy because the sun was coming up at 4.30, quarter to 5, because um, it was summer. The other thing you learn doing that is the animals get really excited. Like, it's unbelievable. You're just like, wow. So, you know, if that's like your main project, um, I was also shooting Nietzsche's High Noon in the Water, but um, it's just, it was just a really interesting thing to do, and it and had some amazing images. When I did them on, um, I did them on split screen, so actually the sunrise and sunsets are together, and you can't tell whether they're rising or setting, <laughs> which is also kind of interesting, right? Just like, so that, I, I didn't, um, bring that one. The, the second one I did, this is uh, the one you're seeing here, is Epoch K Reflections and Blind Residium Caves. I'm going to go through that one. And um, I also did that, in 2009 I did, uh, I shot sinkholes. I shot endless sinkholes um, using Georges Bataille and Simone Veil's concepts of waste and attention. I, and also in 2009 I did, I had this brilliant idea and I've, I've got an excerpt from it. I was like, okay, I'd read Virilio's Vision Machine. I wanted to spend time in the winter in the desert, because I mostly only live in the summer. I went to Jordan, and I, I had uh, two fantastic Bedouin um, guides that were with me. I was riding a camel for eight hours a day, so I don't know if you've been on a camel, but those things are not comfortable. Um, <laughs> I, that, that's OK. I was OK there. Um, and what I did was I, was I tied the camera to the camel, so it was like camel vision machine. And so there's. Um, 
And I haven't quite figured out what to do with the footage other than use it in terms of the vision machine, Berlioz's vision machine. But one part of the footage, and I don't think I've got that here, one part of the footage, the camera, uh, camels are also really skittish, like they'll freak out about anything. So my coat, my jacket fell off the back and it just took off running as hard as it could straight up the mountain. I was just like, uh. And they won't listen to, apparently, female voices, um, <laughs> which I'm a little suspicious of, but okay. Um, <laughs> at that point, I was just, it was really, there was a whole bunch of me screaming and yelling because was, I was absolutely terrified because I, I was like, if I fall off this camel, I'm going to break a whole bunch of bones, right, like that, because it was going, eventually we got it stopped. And... Um, I was like, okay, <laughs> this, you know, but it was a really interesting project and, and the visual idea of like, the, at the eye level visual of the camel going up and down, I, I thought was really cool. Um, shooting the blur, and I'm going to read from that, it's one of the more political pieces. Um, and that is, is done, it's using uh, Deleuze and it's looking at the Syrian state, the Israeli state, the British state, the Jordanian state, the Golan, North Shore of the Dead Sea, Abu Dis, Jerusalem, um, Julio, Bet Jalha, and taking a look. These are all on Vimeo. Um, I did Shooting the Elemental, which is a key concept of Lebanon, is I, for a conference in Alaska. So one of the things I prefer doing is you go in for a conference and you'll make a site-specific um, uh, film that matches the paper you're doing. So the conference was on the Elemental. And I probably won't show that today, but I'll, I'll show it tomorrow. Uh, Walter Benjamin I'll show today because it's really fun, uh, flamur uh, flanuring the ancient arcade ruins using, I'd read um, Benjamin's uh, arcades project twice. I was I'm not grad director now, I'm on sabbatical, but I was grad director and I'm for um, the past two years. And as grad director, you have to be in in the summer, so I was like, okay, how can I amuse myself? Um, and students wanted to read Benjamin's arcade project. And I'd always kind of stayed away from Benjamin's arcade project, arcade's project, because everybody was carrying it around when I was in grad school, and they were really pretentious. So I was like, no, obviously not. Um, as it turns out, it's great. <laughs> it's just great. Um, so I read it with two different people twice, and I went out and tried to use his technique um, to um, produce, to sort of produce the phantasmagoria and enliven the enliven an, the aura of an image. And I'll talk about that. Um, the two I did most recently, one is called Flashes of Perception, and that was done in Baffin Island, the Eastern Arctic this summer, using uh, Heidegger and uh, contemplative photography. And the last one I did, and I want to cover both of these, um, is called The Sinuous Turn, and it's using um, Sam Mellon, who is a phenomenologist who taught at York, and I didn't know it when Gad and I were shooting um, this film, Gad and I worked on, on this one this summer in uh, Crete. Um, I didn't know he died while I was making it. And it was kind of interesting because I was like, okay, I've read Sam Mellon's book twice, which is art, line, and thought. It's really difficult. It's really interesting. It's really quite brilliant. Um, and I was like, okay, now I can go talk to him and show him the film, right? So, which I, I couldn't do, but it was a, it's a really interesting... It's a really interesting film to do, and we also used it for a workshop we did um, in general semantics, uh, a four-day workshop in India, because that fit in nicely with the uh, general semantics we were doing. So I'm going to start with blind residium caves. I'm going to go to about, what time do I get to go to, 5.30 or 20 after? 20 after? Yeah. 20 after, okay. So give me 20 minutes on these. I know that, you know, you may not find this the most interesting, but I'm very passionate about these. Um, these images, <laughs> you know. So blind. So this is this is um, using Herceral, blind residium caves, and it brings into high definition perception. For anybody that knows Herceral, if not, I think you can get it because I, I really geared this for for um, presenting. Um, it brings into high definition perception the phenomenological reduction or epoche, and the phenomenological residium are absolute reflective insight. The project involves digitally phenomenologically seeing Edmund Husserl's residium in the caves of the Judean desert, the, Nuge the Negev, the Golan, the Upper Galilee, and the Lower Jerusalem hills. I'll tell you right now, it's all shot blindfolded. Um, 
Most phenomenological practitioners apply the reduction of putting in parentheses. They usually work with a the cup. They're always using this example of a cup, right? So they apply the reduction of putting in, in parentheses or bracketing the existing object in order to reach through adumbrations down to the intentional object. Well, the intentional object is a reflection of the intentionality of pure consciousness. Pure consciousness, this is where I got interested. I was like, okay, pure consciousness, if it exists, has never been visually revealed. How could you go about visually revealing pure consciousness? I probably can't, but I took a run at it. Phenomenologists have textually seized upon the phenomenological remainder, the being of consciousness which Husserl calls the absolute essence of consciousness, which is not touched by the phenomenological ex exclusion. But there's been never any endeavor to make this residium visually present. So the most unique endeavor of this project was to digitally perceive that is to see and present, or make present, phenomena not only from Husserl's ray of, of directedness that takes the point of departure in the ego, but in addition to digitally perceive, see and present, phenomena from the space of awareness that contains this attentional ray of regard, that is the pure ego. So I was like, okay, how can I do it from the pure ego? I'm working with high definition technology. Since the phenomenologists can select anything they, they want to shine their attentional ray of regard on, I never figured out why they were always selecting cups. Um, I seized upon the cave partly as a, you know, its role in Plato, for example, partly Bataille's work on the cave and cave paintings. So I seized upon the cave, and also because going into caves and repelling underground like 30 meters is pretty scary for me. So that was all good. I had some great guides. Honestly, the guides I had were amazing. Uh, one of the guides was doing his MA in caves. So I was in caves that had been discovered two months before. Um, and we would repel in. Fortunately, also, his wife was a doctor. Yeah, that was true. And he would text what cave we're going into, and we got out, he'd text, right? So they could send out an emergency crew. It's always good to have backup. And thirdly, he was a dad, because some of these I'd go in, and I didn't know this, but you go in caves when you're underground. There's like mountains underground. You know, so you'd be sitting on the edge of a cliff underground, and I'd be crying, okay, because I was like all scared and freaked out. But I, and so he, had, because he had kids, he was just, or he was just a great person, but he was great. He was really good. You know, because eventually, very quickly, I'd get over crying and being scared and go do whatever it was I had to do, which was get blindfolded and take images and wander around. But I had no idea that the underground, then I found out that people do it as extreme sports. I'm like, what? <laughs> Um, really, <laughs> I don't get it. But um, there's a whole, it's unbelievable, like the, the inversion in the mountains underground. So, so the most unique project then was to digitally perceive that which can't be seen. And I did it for 45 days. And I used the techniques, I used to lose techniques here of perception image, particularly if you, if you uh, read cinema one and two particularly in Cinema 1, the movement image, he has a thing called gaseous perception that, that um, worked very well for this. Partly what Deleuze talks about is perception images, and that's what I'm all about, are seen from the point of view of another eye. The purest vision of a non-human eye, of an eye that would be in things. For those of you that have done work in object-oriented ontology and also Lacan's work on the gaze, that's where I'm kind of going with this. So, so it's the pure vision of, of a non-human eye, which would be in things. It's the anonymous, unidentified viewpoint of the camera, what Deleuze calls gaseous perception, the pure vision of the non-human eye, in which the videographer and the camera function as intentionality directed toward the object perceived. So intentionality draws meaning from what is already there in the object. That is, what I was really trying to do is animate the vision of matter. I combined the methods of phenomenological reduction and phenomenological residuum in 50 caves. And some were above ground. Some were actually, as, as uh, 
low as 50 meters below ground. So in terms of phenomenological reduction, I bracketed or suspended judgment of the cave, that is the natural attitude of the cave on hand, as an existing object in the world. What I'm left with then is a perception of the cave. And I directed the phenomenologist's, phenomenologist's eagle ray of attention. And when necessary, I used a hiking light in my head. Because sometimes it's dark underground. Attention, Husserl says, is comparable to a spot of light. So I was like, hiking light will work. The object of intention lies in the cone or the more or less bright light. What the camera was seeing and capturing was, of course, adumbrations of the perceived from a certain light angle distance, which present certain degrees of color. That might be the end. Certain degrees of color, shape, texture. I should have put that one on loop. Let's put it on loop. I got my lens wet. I was back behind that. I repeated, so we've got degrees of color, shape, texture. I repeated five to ten adumbrations in each of the 50 caves I was in. The adumbrations were shot and timed randomly and presented. Uh, perception was privileged over the naive natural attitude. So the phenomenological method has been done endless, endlessly. What I performed was, that was different is that I shot the footage blindfolded. I would, I would um, climb or repel into the cave. I'd tie a kafia, um around my eyes. And in terms of the, the phenomenological residuum, I bracketed the eagle ray of attention by blindfolding myself once inside the cave. Blindfolded, I would randomly shoot adumbrations of the cave by pointing the camera in front to each side above towards the ground. I would do this sitting cross-legged, lying down, standing, sometimes standing and walking, sometimes crawling. There's some caves you can, you can only crawl through. What I put in parentheses here is sight. Sight of the human eye through which the eagle ray of attention manifests itself in Husserl's visual phenomenology. The residuum is a technological residuum. The camera with the built-in light functioning as a technological ray of attention presents adumbrations of the cave that visual consciousness was neither perceiving nor non-perceiving. In a sense, by bracketing the eye and the eye, I bracketed the ego that could stop or initiate reflection. What Husserl distinguishes as a point like I, the functional center. By putting the I, I, ego in parentheses, what remains, the residuum, is perhaps not pure awareness, but a more open awareness that facilitates and is facilitated by a technological perceiving and presentation of the perceived as perceived. By bracketing the human eye, the ego reflection is held in abeyance, open and waiting to be penetrated by the intentional object. So I'm going to go to extreme waste. And I think I would like to do shooting them. I want to do beautiful waste and maybe shooting the blur of the og and blink, one or the other. This one's only a minute. It's a short one. I'll see if I'll talk fast. So extreme attention on, on beautiful waste. There are 2,000, there's an hour and, and 57 minute film I have on sinkholes, which I've also got there. But there are 2,000 registered sinkholes at 30 different sites. Now this is in uh, the West Bank, OK, in Israel. And, the, and, uh, and all, it's in the West Bank and in Israel. The north shore from Ein Fresca of the, um, Ein Fresca from the, on the north of the Dead Sea to Ein Bokok, where all those hotels are, and the Dead Sea works are on the south shoreline. What's really interesting to me is on the other side in Jordan, there's only one sinkhole. So you can pretty much guess the reason there's so many sinkholes is the Dead Sea works are pulling the minerals out. And they're pulling the minerals out to make, you know, cosmetics and, and uh, salt. So the ground, 
What was brilliant there is the ground is imploding at a quite rapid ecological speed. Sinkholes are the accident of technological excessive extraction of minerals for human use, and that used to be a campground, and of the evaporation of water. Shooting them is like being in the carnage of war. It's, it's really fascinating. And here the concept I used was uh, Simone, the primary concept was Simone Vale's concept of attention from gravity and grace. Absolute unmixed attention is prayer. Extreme attention is what constitutes the creative faculty in the human. Extreme attention which is what constitutes the creative faculty in human. And I keep going back to this and, and, and different concepts of attention. So sinkholes are a void from below, that into which we fall when we allow our natural facilities to become atrophied. The meditation is a constant attention, an active attention, a looking without attachment, and also a making sure you don't fall in them. I worked with Vale for three reasons. She's a disaster thinker, she has an intensity of doing, she's about work and force, and she's wild. The liberal ethicists and rights thinkers are always trying to trap her in their discourse, and she's not trappable. Um, it's the excess, the sacred, that which can't be contained that saves her. And this is what Georges Bataille fell in love with. So work for Vale is time entering the body. We turn ourselves into matter through work. Shooting sinkholes is more work than shooting caves. It requires extreme attention. You give a complete attention to the object during the 30-second shot. Moving among the sinkholes, one must give complete attention to the ground. I had an extreme guide, um, Gundi Shahal, who works with Friends of the Earth, and her husband happened to be head of the rescue team, which is also good. Um, there are two, and people, every year, two or three people go into the sinkholes. You have to be taken out really fast because it, it's toxic. Um, there are two types of ground surrounding the sinkholes, Most moist, dry, gravel, salt, which you saw first, and, um, sorry, mo moist mud, this is kind of dry mud, and gravel, dry gravel salt. The latter is more dangerous, it's more brittle. The woman was, I mean, I, I totally love Gundy, but um, she's totally fearless, right? So you, she would be like right up there, like, you know, walking through, crunching. It was really, it was really interesting. I also used, and I won't go into it because I want to do a couple of other ones, but I used Spinoza's concept of canatus, that is, um, the, the, every, the extended substance is moved towards self-preservation because it's gone in sinkholes. It's absent. Canatus is absent. And also, uh, Virilio's obviously um, accident, but Heidegger's time as well. And I think what I'm going to do is two other ones. They're shorter, and I'll save shooting the blur for tomorrow, which is the quite political one. I will do Flaneuring Archive Ruins. Put that on loop. And the one done in Panerton. It's moving, right? Let me know if that, yep, changed, okay. I'll do flashes of perception last. So this is Walter Benjamin. It was done in 2012. Ruins, as understood by Walter Benjamin, are remains of the past worn by time, nature, and commercialization. The intent applying Benjamin's idea of telescoping the past through the present. So that's a one of the concepts I'm working with with Benjamin, is telescoping the past through the present, is to disassemble and reassemble these arcades through the attention of production. That's the attention of videoing and editing, and the distraction of the technique of montage, because he writes about montage in the arcades project. And he uses, well, it's hard to say because he didn't put the Arcades Project together, but you can see montage operating in the Arcades Project. The dialectic of attention and distraction drives the project. Uh, Benjamin talks about the dialectic of attention and distraction. Attention of shooting six shots per arcade. 
so I worked with um, uh, Yulia Oper and Lev Martyr, graduate student and his partner, who is a, fortunately a, a guide, among other things. So we shot close-up panorama, Kino Agua optics, wide and narrow partial object, and layered. The shots, now that is, the, the Kino Agua optics is, I had my underwater camera in a fishbowl with water, colored water in it, it was shooting through there. So we would be out with the, you know, I was shooting that obviously because they didn't want to do it. Um, but we'd be, I'd, I'd be out shooting that. The shots are 30 seconds each, edited to 10 seconds for the close-up panorama, Kina Agua Optics, six, that's a Kina Agua Optics one, six seconds for the wide and narrow partial objects and four seconds for the layered. The close attention given to the shots in montage sequencing gives way to distracted viewing. The desire is that the phantasmagoria, term, that's Benjamin's term, here the phantasmagoria is panorama, kino agua optics, partial object, and layered image. So the intention here, or the desire, is that, that the phantasmagoria of these will revitalize the image's optical aura so that the object image looks back at the viewer. You can see we're influenced by Lacan there. And in shooting the blur, I'm much more explicit about Lacan. So in a sense, flaneuring ancient archite ruins picks up. We're shooting the blur, which I'll show tomorrow, leaves off. But the idea is that there's a pre-existing gaze, a kind of staring at us by the outside world, the imperceptible that belongs to the object. And this, in a sense, also telegraphs what's become object-oriented ontology or ontography where objects are objects without concern for the question of a subject's access to the object. And, and I recently shot from a biplane in Sedona last year. I was trying to shoot strictly object-oriented ontology by sticking the camera out, um, clicking every 10th second, click, click, click. I, used a, I usually use video, but I used it still. Clicking and just shooting what was happening without, like, so, so allowing the objects to have um, their, their selves um, without a question of the subject's access to the object. And the biplane was pretty awesome, I have to say. So the one I'm going to end with, and it's the one um, that was shot in Panertung in, the, in Baffin Island this last summer. And I have to find it. Because of course I thought I could go through all of them. I kind of knew I, I kind of knew I couldn't. The Panner Tongue one was interesting because I was part of a um, summer school, and I'm also part of a, a project performance. And um, there it is. It's very short. I'm part of a, a politics and performance project that has 15 universities in 15 people from seven different universities and and also um, the Hemispheric Institute involved in that is obviously the um, Agua, the Agua shot, Agua optics shot. Yeah. So it's called Augenblink. So it's a four and a half minute and 40 second Augen blink of the colors. Did I start it? No. Okay. Of the colors, motion, sounds, and shadows, and patterns of three Nunavut sites Panartung, Cumberland Sound, Sanaru. Santa Rue is um, way out in the land. It was shot from July 9th to July 18th, 2013, while I was part of the Panertung Summer School. Flashes of Perception brings together Martin Heidegger's concept of Augenblink, moment of authentic presence, temporal moment, in which we respond to the way in which being addresses us, bringing nearness in farness and farness in nearness, all in the glance of an eye. 
So I bring this together with the practice of contemplative photography. I've taken a couple of workshops in contemplative photography at the Mixang um, School in Toronto. So if you ever get a chance, they're usually over a weekend, they teach you how to go out and just see, okay? Not see as a label, but just see. So you learn how to shoot color, shadow, um, and the, the deal is like see it, shoot it. Okay, so you, so it's actually a great practice, a very meditative practice. In doing contemplative photography, the, pla the flash of perception is that moment of seeing, excuse me, that is one-pointed, stable, and free from distraction. The moment of the flash, the Augen blink, is free from discursive shot. It is, an, it is the world, it's the earth and the world in a glance of an eye. So one of the first things they ask you to do, right, in contemplative photography is what you do, and I don't know if anybody's taken this workshop, but the first thing you have to do is like you turn around and you have to just turn around and shoot as soon as your eye hits. And I got like right there. But you, so you don't know where it's going to hit, so you, I got you guys. <laughs> but, so you don't know where it's going to, you don't know where your eye's going to fall kind of thing, right? So that was, that was really useful to bring together with um, some of the work I'd done, I'd done on Heidegger. And I just want to close what I'll, oh, that's an amazing iceberg. Maybe I'll just let that loop. I'll let that loop. And perfect, 20 after. Okay. Thank you very much. You're totally welcome. Thank you. Nice. As the site where you decided to test out these concepts and practice. It's a great, um, it's a great question. Both, both the, the fact that they're very obscure locations, but also it sounds like many of them were in the Middle East mm -hmm. and that region, and whether there was a kind of a geopolitical aspect to the location that you chose to work these Those are great questions. Um, yes, uh, in a sense, yes. Um, I like remote locations. Number one. So, and of course, you could do this anywhere, but with a remote location, and, and I've had a, you know, I've had some funding to go shoot it, right, but not so much. Um, so, in shooting the blur, it's very explicitly political, and it's deterritorializing de um, the remainder of different states in, in the Middle Eastern region of, of Israel, Palestine. Um, I happen to really love the Judean Desert, so that's part of it. I wanted to shoot, uh, I particularly picked it first off because um, I wanted to do a response to Heidegger's hut. Okay, because Heidegger did all this stuff and he had this hut in the, in the forest. And I was like, what is the opposite of the forest that Heidegger had his hut in and was writing in? And he wasn't just writing in, he was having people visit him. He's having his grad students come in um, and they were sort of stomping around. They're marching around in Nazi uniforms at points, right? So, okay, so I was like, okay, what would be like a good... And so for me, the, the stillness, um, I was like, I'll do it in the desert. I'll do it in the Judean desert. So that was the first shot. Then I found out there were tons of caves there. So then I went from there. But there's tons of caves in, in India as well. Um, and I'll come back to that in a second. The next thing I'm shooting is zero. And I'll be shooting zero uh, in, in Ran of Koch in India, which is amazing because it's a salt lake. I'm shooting it all in salt lakes. So it's a salt lake that you can't see the horizon. Um, I also want to shoot in Utah and in Cyprus. Okay, so that, um, that answer there. The other, the other more remote are um, the Arctic and Alaska. So the ele shooting the elementals in Alaska and the Panner tongue is in the Arctic. Partly those were site-specific because I was going to be there. So sometimes it's because I'm going to be there. One of the things I really wanted to do and I shoot the elemental the way Alfonso Lingus shoots the face in Levinas's work, right? In his, in his book, The Community of Those Who Have Nothing... I think it's The Community of Those Who Have Nothing in Common, right? Okay, so he shoots the face, and he's using Levinas's concept of the face there. The elemento is basically the face of, the side view, the face of mountains, visages, like all that, right? So I really, I wanted to do that site-specific, so it depends where I am. Um, and I also really, because I'd worked so much with my own body, and I've always had this ethics of not really shooting other people's bodies. Okay, so I work with my own body, and then I was like, well, if I'm going to 
move. I, I don't really, I don't really feel right about shooting people. Right? Like I just, and, and I don't, because I'm, I'm really testing out theoretical concepts, so unless, and I want to be able to use them, so the actual shooting of other people, I wanted to really bracket the human body and try to do it with a technological eye, and a technological eye that can see more of nature than the human eye can see. So partly to go back, there is a couple that are political. Um, one of them I'll be showing tomorrow, overtly political. Um, some are site specific because I was going to be there and I wanted to do something. As soon as I know I'm going to be somewhere, I will prepare to do that, right? So the Sedona one, I knew I was going to be there. I wanted to shoot um, object-oriented ontology on rocks from the air. You know, so I, I kind of see where I'm going to be and then try and work out. And then I'll spend quite a bit of time reading the theory for it. So when I knew I was going to be in the um, Eastern Arctic, Panertung, I really wanted to work with uh, Heidegger's Augenblink. And I worked with a research student on, on, on reading that. Um, and also with contemplative photography. So I took the workshop, to, uh, I retook it to do that. So yeah, but it's a really good question. And I think I would have to say you, there is a politics involved. Um, it's explicit in shooting the blur. Um, the rest, there was a politics initially in responding to Heidegger in that location. Um, I tend to always stay in the West Bank. Okay, so um, there's a, somewhat of a politics there. I, you know, so I mean, it depends. It broadly defined, yeah. And sometimes it's just ha going to happen to be somewhere. But that's a great question. Thank you. I'm going to show you a SEMO. So I mean, the thing, and I think your question is good because you know you really don't have to be here to shoot Augenblink. You can shoot Augenblink anywhere, right? Um, the SEMO one, I. I did a SEMO because I was at Ars Electronica. And it's OK. I'll tell you what, we don't need it on. You'll get the idea. So a SEMO is the Sony robot. And I, wanna, I use this for a Lacan lecture, right? Because, because he's doing the hula. And, and you know, OK, it's just kind of cheesy sound. It doesn't matter. It's just but he's doing the hula. He um, has an eagle ray of attention. He's got this attention ray right there. He can run. He can't talk, so they have to have somebody talking for him. He can run. He can interact. He's censored, so he can interact with people. He's pretty, he's pretty awesome. And he can play a game. He gets, the, he gets the audience up there to play a game with him, and he can do the same game, which run over and step on the, step on the, thing that, the star that makes it go out. Yeah. And so I thought, well, that is really interesting. In our relation to things by way of vision, something slips past us is always to some great degree alluded in it. I thought that was a really interesting thing. There he's clapping for the audience. Um, I thought it was a really interesting way to have as a, as a background, um, one of the background films for uh, a lecture I was doing on Lacan's gaze. You know, so that, in a sense, I'll drop text on something that's related to it. And I have to say, most of the films the students make are great. Like, probably better than mine. But that's OK. Yeah? Uh, this is just a bit about a larger question. Sure. Uh, since you're working in, you know, in an academic, uh, traditional setting where there are a lot of, there's a lot of red tape and a lot of policies and a lot of politics that go along to working in an institution. Um, what are the various, various affordances or challenges that you've had to overcome that's um, in, your, in your own Hey, in your own work? you know, mine all came early on. I have been extremely fortunate. I mean, partly there are no people in here, so I don't have to have consent forms signed, OK? Um, if I'm using found footage, it's footage that's on the internet, so the students use found footage, or people that, for their films, people that they have agreed that they can, like, you know, some of them are using their mom and their little brother that have signed that it's okay for the films they're producing. And their films are not posted on the internet. They're just, I mean, they, they can put it private viewing, but for me. Um, I took a couple of workshops at York, I teach at York, provided on integration of digital into, into um, teaching. Uh, I was part of a pilot program. Um, and I told them what I wanted to do with theory. I told them what I was going to do. Um, the only ethics clearance I had to get in any of the work I've done was obviously for working in a um, uh, laboratory, biological laboratory. 
And basically, the, and the, and the, ethics, the ethics review at York is fantastic, actually. So um, basically, the rule there is that you have to adhere to the rules of the institution you're in. Okay, so I was working in Symbiotica at the University of Western Australia, so that was according to their rules, right? So that, I haven't had any problems um, at all, actually. And when I went up for full, I used, I, they had the links for this, I used what I was doing both, you know, one of the books I went up for full on was Fast Feminism, um, and I went up for full also on like Shooting Theory and some other like books I'd done and stuff, right? But I, I haven't had, I haven't had any sort of problems so far. Um, partly because, you know, I explain what I'm doing. I'm doing it. I'm, I don't really anticipate problems. I'm not asking people to do anything like, you know, okay, so if I get hurt in a cave, it's just me, right? Like, I didn't have research assistants with me in a cave, right? So, I mean, that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. And York has really got a good sort of ethics review process in place. I hate the word in place, that phrase, but, but they really do. And the people sitting on the ethics review are people that are colleagues, right? And so they, and they're, you know, so it rotates and they basically want to make sure that anybody doing, you know, undergraduate work that involves people are, or the other thing is if you're a grad student and you're going into a risk area, right? So risk area would primarily be like a natural disaster and or a political, a political risk area. Um, so when I was grad director, some of our grad students were going into a risk area, but that's where they lived. That's where they came from, right? Like that was where their home was. They were going to do work there. So they want to assess that because the university doesn't want to be liable, basically. But yeah, it's a very good question. Have you been having trouble with ethics boards? No, I, I don't even mean specifically with ethics. I just mean, you know, within an academic institution, there's various uh, things that you need to that you need to abide by. Oh yeah, I did all that. Certain types of scholarship yeah, are, yeah. are more sought after or more. Yeah. I'm a pretty high I'm a pretty high level theorist. That's why I can get away with yeah. it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's inspirational to see. You know, like I can't imagine myself doing the, trying to uh, do some of the things and give yourself thirty years. <laughs> I mean, maybe I'm mean, in a sense right because you know, like I'm like what am I now? Fifty eight. Okay. So in that sense, I've been working a long time. I'm actually. You know, and, and I've been teaching a long time and, and all of that. So in a sense, people, like, I hit them with really high-level theory in all my lectures, like really high-level theory. And it's really surprising to me what third year, like modern political thought, you know. They're learning Lacan, they're learning Schmidt, they're learning, like, you know, postmodernism, they've got Kant going on. Like, I usually teach everything but Marx because we've got lots of people teaching Marx, so I don't really teach much Marx, right? Not because I'm opposed to Marx, it's just because there's lots of Marx being taught in my department at York, right? Which is great. Um, so, and I teach, you know, Christian thinkers as well, like really, like all of that. It's amazing what people at third year can learn. Like their capacity is amazing. So I've never had anybody suggest that I wasn't doing high caliber theory. Because I am, right? Um, what's interesting then is how you can actually, and I find this fascinating, um, but how you can actually materialize concepts so people get it. And so that would be more where I, I was kind of going with that. Yeah. Yeah. But no, that's also a very good question because, and I also maintain, like, in order to work with really high level theory and mess with it, you have to know it. Right? Like, if you jump in, and you can really tell the difference too, and I'm really strict on that with students, like, if you just jump in and start messing with it, you, it's going to be pretty obvious. You know? So I think that's like the first, the first place. So that's why, you know, like, I, the Heidegger stuff, I work with people on it, reading it and reading it. And you know, Heidegger's not easy for me, for example, whereas for some people it's really easy. Like, it seems that most people I work with in Heidegger, the grad students, are like Heidegger nerds somehow, right? They just, you know, they absorb it and literally they explain it again and again until you finally get it, right? And then I sort of test it out. So I mean, I really work that way on stuff. Like Herschel too, I had a whole year reading course on Herschel before I went out and did it. But I can teach her so now, but when I started out, I was like, I have no idea, right, you know? So, I mean, I try to keep it interesting for me. Is that sound okay? <laughs> I try to keep myself interested. No. <laughs> That's great. The other question I had was about the role of digitality. Um, and it it, I found it interesting that both the description of the talk and your comments really um, emphasize the role of digital video, um, in particular because typically in film scholarship, 
celluloid film is connected to attention and contemplation. Nice. And digital video is connected to waste, distraction, yes. excessive filming, yeah. you know, yeah. uncontemplative tourism through the gallery. Yes, yes. Um, and so it was very interesting to me to, to, um, to hear you discuss about digital video in context with contemplative attention. And I was hoping you I, that's, a really, that's a really astute observation, and thank you. Um, Partly I, well, first of all, I'm not a film, I, I mean, I can make films, but, but digital, like video films. Um, but I also wanted to use the medium that everybody is using, obviously, right? So, you know, a lot of stuff, like a, students are shooting, you can shoot on anything, right? Obviously, as we all know. So I wanted to use something that was really like sort of the digital explosion. So it's going to be like digital. I even, I'm probably going to move to using, um, what do you call it, pro. I usually just edit on like iMovie. Because I wanted to do, I wanted to edit on something that's readily available, but I think I might move to the pro one. I just did a workshop on it, took one, and the reason to do that is not only this, which, but I've also videoed workshops because hey, I have a camera and people ask me to do it, like okay, and you know, and and I haven't had it mic'd as well, and I want to beef up the sound, so I think I'm going to have to sort of switch to that because I did, I edited like 22. Um, um, 44 hours of GADS workshops in Radical General Semantics. And then, you know, at York, I'm grad director, I'm there all the time, so I, I, I videoed all our workshops and then edited them, right? So I've got all this stuff on there. And I'm thinking, damn, the sound, where sound is not, you know, is not as crucial when you're working with mostly image and soundscapes, but the sound, so I think I may move to using, um, what is it called, the professional one? Not a, Final Cut Pro, yeah, which has really dropped in price now because it used to be like 1400 bucks, 1200 bucks. Now it's like three something. So I'm thinking, okay, well, that's more of a, an affordable means, right, for people. But I really wanted to try and keep it like rough like that, as you're saying, you know, and also to, to show that even, because I don't buy the whole idea that you can't do three or four things at once and have a strong attention, you know, which is one of the reasons when I lecture, I have this in the background. I lecture, I don't care if they're online, as long as, so they can be online, okay. I've never had any trouble with that, and they've been very good in the, the seminars and everything, right? So I mean, like, I think you can do um, a number of different things at once, so you could have attention and distraction, so I kind of wanted to work with a medium that facilitated that. The other thing I would say is one of the pieces that has influenced me most, and when I was presenting shooting theory at the JJ School of Art in Mumbai, which was really quite incredible because it's like an amazing art school, and uh, Gad and I were presenting. Gad was presenting radical general semantics. I was and, and we were co-presenting. I was presenting um, an afternoon of shooting theory and, and putting it in that, linking it there, was that uh, the room was surrounded. The people in the class, all their paintings were surrounding the room, right? So it was just amazing. So you could actually use their own work as examples of different things, which was just worked out really well. Um, and I really, you know, I, I really think that, that one can get theory, even if they haven't read The Theorist, if you're combining it with sort of visual imagery. You know? And I'd be interested tomorrow for people to tell me if that's the case. You know, and I mean, there's the obvious question, well, if I looked at this and didn't know the theory, would I see that? And the answer would be no. No, you really, it, it really, you really need the, the words to indicate what's going on there. You would probably see different shots of rocks and try and figure out why the person is doing so many um, of certain things, right? And, and just to add to that, the, the Deleuze book on Cinema 1 and 2, his techniques, and I'm going back and I'm reading that with my GA um, starting next week, going back and reading it again for the third time to try and work out his filming techniques because that is very much um, influenced me. What I was going to say about India was somebody asked me if uh, I'd seen Vertov, um, Man with a Video Camera, or Man with a Camera. And I was like, my God, yeah, I used to just like let that loop in the background. Like, Man with a Camera is brilliant because it's got speed. It's got, and he's got people, right? He's got like the Russian Revolution and the changes there. There's like childbirth. Like it's all just hitting you. Like it's just one of the most amazing attention, dialect of, of attention distraction um, pieces I've ever seen. Have you seen it or no? Yeah, I just, do you like it? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, I, it's amazing.
It might not be the students and the other questions, but I, I have a question a little bit. Uh, so when you were introducing your videos, you were always uh, kind of, it was really interesting to hear about the practice, either doing it blindfolded. And I wondered, do you always, when you introduce your films, like either in lecture or other contexts, how important is it to talk about the practice of how you shot it? And can they sort of stand alone with the theorists without thinking about the actual That's great. Um, partly what? I think they have to have the technique, whatever it is, because sometimes you shoot 30 seconds, but you edit 10 seconds. So I think you need to include that. I don't think you need, I don't think, I was just like kind of putting that in. I don't think you need me saying like I did this here, there, that kind of thing, right? But I think, you know, when I was talking about we shot six shots, 30 seconds each, cut down to 10 seconds, I think you need things like that in there. Just, and you need to know that you're applying in a particular way to lose this technique of something. So I think, I do think you need that. Uh, what I'm doing, I didn't get to the end, but so I'm, I'm publishing it as a scalar book project as well as a print text, right? The scalar book project then, I don't know if you've seen them or not, but at Hemispheric Institute, I was at a scalar book launch and it's great, it's open source. Um, you've got all different links on there. You can embed your video. It looks really cool, actually, and it was, it's really nice. So in that sense, I think I might say how they were shot. You know, because I think, you know, I mean, also if you're doing it, if you've evacu if the body, if you've evacuated the body, but you, obviously somebody's shooting, right? So then you may want to know how you shot it and why a particular location for that theorist. And sometimes it's just mundane that you're going to be there, you know. But yeah, that's a great question. I mean, what do you think? Well, because I thought, I thought in some ways, like, learning that this is the way I was trying to see was important for me in terms of understanding what I was seeing and it was really helpful. Um, but I didn't know if, if, if that was always like you always presented that way or I, I tend to. It was really intentional, I guess. Yeah, I tend to because I also I want people when you're hitting people with like high level theory, like really high level theory, you I actually as a technique I always kinda like to break it up a bit. You know, and so that's part of it, I guess. You know, because I mean obviously I had, you know, early on you know, I still have trouble reading Kant. There's certain aspects of Kant I really like, and I work with Kant. But pure reason, man, critique of pure reason, I have read that twice with different grad students. I don't get it. They get it. And I'm just like, you know, like, whereas the stuff on the, uh, the, the aesthetic critique, I do get and I use, right? So I mean, sometimes there's stuff you don't get. So it's quite, I, to me, people in an audience or a, a lecture hall, I can kind of understand what they're not getting and why that would be. So I try to sort of mix that, sort of mix that in. So that's a good question. Actually, the questions are great. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Oh, you're most welcome. Thank you, guys. That's great.